Medieval, and we have a real treat today in our special guest, who is Matthew Harfey, author of the Benicia Chronicles. He's also just started a new series, A Time for Swords, that starts with the Viking invasion of Lindisfarne, which is a fabulous, um, I think there's two novels in that series now. So without further ado, let's welcome Matthew Harfey. Matthew, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hi, Matthew. Hello, Derek. Uh, let's let's start off. Let's take you back to when you first started writing the Benicia Chronicles. It's set in Northumberland. It's set in the seventh century, before the Vikings, before Alfred the Great, even. Why that period and why that particular area? The simple answer is it's sort of a, a, a bit random, really. But I guess it it was as a result of different things looking back i can understand you know why i ended up falling into that sort of place and I, I guess the time specifically was because i saw a documentary in 2001 um on television called meet the ancestors and they were in bambra castle or just south of bambra castle and they there was a burial ground there in the dunes or near the dunes near bambra castle within sight of the castle um, and they'd dug up lots of skeletons, and some of these dated back to the seventh century. And they talked about Benicia and how Bambra Castle, as it was known, Bebenberg at the time, was the seat of the kings of Benicia, which became the northernmost part of Northumbria um, later on in history. And so that was why that period. I think it just something about that documentary kind of sparked my interest but the reason I think it sparked my interest especially in that area was because I'd lived for a few years as a kid in Northumberland um, on the in fact on the banks of the Tweed oh, yeah. Yeah. in a little village called Norham and I'd been to Bamber Castle um, a few times so I, I knew the area and I'd loved the sort of coastline of, Northum of Northumberland and so I felt some affinity with the place and the time just became interesting to me. I knew nothing about it um, back then in uh, in sort of 2001, but I just started writing and then started researching and realising there was this whole period of history that was very underrepresented in fiction and even in um, the history books, really, yeah. uh, as far as I could see um, in, in any great detail. And so I just um, started writing and then things, things happened and that I ended up sort of falling into that period really yeah i mean as you say i mean the, the area it's a fabulous area a nice area to go to to research as well yeah i haven't actually done i haven't done a lot of research in person in northumberland over the years i mean i sort of relied a lot on my memories and and in other research but i recently this year or last year 2022 i've been up twice up to to that neck of the woods and it's been great actually re revisiting some of the places that you know i remember yeah. fondly and also that i've researched so closely as well over the years so it's been it's been great going back to in lindisfarne and in bambra and i went to norham as well and the tweed and it was brilliant as you said it, it's it's an underrepresented area of history as well what has always been called the dark ages how dark did you find it how difficult was it to research well, very dark. I think, in fact, I've written a few articles over the years and for blog posts and things about the term the Dark Ages. And I know that historians hate it. Yeah. And now they, it, it's called the early medieval. But I think the term the Dark Ages is actually pretty good because I, I, I've argued the case for the term the Dark Ages for different reasons. But I think the lack of 
history of really contemporary history you know, written down at the time is is you know is, is part of that so there's a real darkness in terms of actually knowing exactly what happened and to whom and, and where and and lots of that is up for for grabs we don't really know i mean things have been discovered all the time archaeology and things but yeah yeah there are a lot of gaps in in what i could find out and the real detail as far as i could work out really was only there's stuff in the anglo-saxon chronicle which is very scant it's just a few lines here and there and it was written a couple of centuries later as well at least mm. um, but it's things like you know oswald had a battle against pender at, at somewhere and that's it you know and and, yeah. and pender won or oswald won or whatever that you don't really get much more than that no. and then you've got the venerable bead who was writing only a few decades later and he does write in quite a lot of detail about some of the events but obviously it's all very skewed from the perspective of the christian church and looking at you know how the events can be explained by you know the the grace of god and things like that so it's it's quite a one-sided conversation yeah but so those are the two sources that i relied on most really i would look at for the benicia chronicles look at bead and then the anglo-saxon chronicle and then write around those sort of those main sort of events and take them as read that they were true as well so i decided early on that i would decide that you know what bead said was true and those things had, had largely happened so even when he talks about miracles and things I'd, i thought well maybe there's I can I can explain those things away, but you know maybe I don't need to. But they definitely believe that those things happened, and so I can you know. And when he says there was a certain events and battles and things, I would try to incorporate those as much as I could into the story. Yeah. Um. But the rest of the time, being such a dark period in terms of the, the lack of history, it meant I could make up good stories around the what we do know. You should try the fifth century. That, that's even harder. <laughs> I, I imagine it is. Yeah. I had a reviewer once who said I would have liked more about the actual history of the period. To which I replied, "So would I," yeah. <laughs> because there isn't any. No, very difficult period to to research. Does the scarcity of sources mean you have free reign, or do you feel obliged to actually work out what might have happened and what the most plausible outcome would have been, or do you just think, "Oh, I'll just go with it"? They they don't tell me, so I can just make it up. Uh, a bit of both, I think. I think it's definitely. I was going to say it's definitely a, a, a plus. I think it makes it easier in some ways to write about the period because once I've done some research, if it's you know if it's a, a picture, you can imagine a, a painting. It's kind of like the broad brushstrokes are there from the sources, but the rest of all the detail I can sort of pencil in and you know scratch in. But I'll try and I'll I'll look at the, you know what people have written about things and what archaeology there is and try to come up with the most plausible um, location for a battle, for example. And but then it's the question of you know why do they end up up there you know so there's a battle from um, mesa field which supposedly according to many people um, took place in oswestry because oswestry comes from the term oswald's tree <laughs> <laughs> Oswald is defeated there and apparently stuck on a tree or whatever. But but I decided after lots of sort of research and reading around the subject and looking at the different options that it didn't make a huge deal of sense that the battle would be there. And so I moved it somewhere else. And you know, it's not I'm not the first person to 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 think it wasn't there. Lots of people have, have posited other other ideas and other locations. So I'll I'll look at things like that and I'll because you've got to come up with a with a reason in the book for why do the people why do the characters end up in that location? Yeah. If it doesn't really make a lot of sense to, to me then I, I'll have to come up with a solution that does make sense so it didn't seem to make a huge lot of sense to, for Oswald to be probing deep into into the Mercian territory almost into into you know, Wales so I you know I decided to, to move the battle and have the Mercians attacking into Northumbria yeah it makes sense and it works yeah well I mean hopefully yeah, hopefully it works I mean I've had nobody interestingly enough I've had nobody write back to me and say that <laughs> it, it's total rubbish you know, and it, where, you know often you get people writing and saying well, I totally disagree with with this you know decision you've made or whatever you, you sort of read a lot about that happening to, to authors but in that case about the location of that battle nobody's written to me and said that they disagree with me so i'm happy with that i think the i think the um it was the monks in oswestry um some sort of few hundred years later that decided that it was a good way of revenue revenue stream for them to say that oswald had died there mm. in the sort of later medi medieval period you find that a lot it's like the monks at glastonbury finding king arthur and guinevere just when they needed some money <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that's most surprising to me is that how many modern historians um, or, you know, history books just 
basically just take it as red and just go, oh, well, you know, it must have happened here because we've got this place called Oswestry. So we're just going to say that this battle took place there because they don't know because there's no, yeah. we don't know, you know, because the name Maserfield doesn't exist anymore. So we don't know so the names that are in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and in Bede don't relate to a modern place. It's very difficult to pinpoint. Yeah, that can be annoying. Yeah. But I think the, I think overall the scarcity of sources is a good thing. Mm. I think it means I have to do some sort of mental agility to try and work out, you know, how to, to thread things together to make the story work. But at the same time, it does give me more free reign uh, as long as it sort of makes sense. Mm. So what is the most difficult aspect of writing in the early medieval historical landscape? Well, if you're talking about the physical landscape of the medieval period... <laughs> then that's uh, that's one thing. If you're talking about sort of a metaphorical landscape, I suppose that's something different. But I can answer both, probably. The the, the physical landscape is quite difficult in terms of the, the, the actual land has just changed a lot. So obviously it's very difficult to understand what things would have looked like, um, what Britain would have looked like, or what any place would have looked like. You know, rivers, rivers have moved, the coastline has changed, forests have changed, the types of trees have changed, the types of animals that we have roaming around have changed. Buildings obviously have, have appeared out of nowhere, bridges and things. So all of that is a real challenge. But I think trying to actually imagine and obviously researching as well, but looking back and trying to, to work out, you know, there was a Roman bridge here at some point, but this, my books are set a couple of hundred years after the Romans. Was the Roman bridge still there? Obviously, the modern day bridges weren't there. You know, there's a medieval bridge built in the 14th century or something. You know, what, what happened in between the Roman bridge and the 14th century bridge and trying, you know, things like that, trying to sort of maybe the, the information isn't there and I have to kind of just use my intuition or a bit of you know uh, common sense or whatever and try and work out you know what people have done in the meantime but um, th I find that interesting and I do a lot of research about the um, you know what native trees there were at the time because people yeah I often read in historical fiction people mentioning animals or trees that didn't exist at the time and it, it rubs me up the wrong way because like, cause the information's out there, so it's just a case of lack of research, really, that they haven't gone to that level of detail. And obviously, I'll have made mistakes and got things wrong. So, I mean, I'm sure there's things that I've written that people will be reading thinking, oh, if only, you know, he's, he's got that wrong. But And in terms of the sort of the historical, political landscape or whatever else <laughs> we mean by sort of uh, the historical landscape. I think the difficulty really of that is just understanding how people thought and and the interaction between different peoples and different religions and different countries. And I don't think humans have changed very much um, over the years. In fact, probably not at all. But our outlook to things and the way people interact and the way people think of things have. And I'm pretty sure if we wrote something in a way that was 100% authentic to the times that I'm writing about, it would be quite unpalatable to a modern reader. Yeah. So it's getting a balance of what feels real, what feels authentic and what also will work for a modern reader, I think is um, kind of difficult. Yeah. Because you have to find something that's interesting to everybody, don't you? And the way Bigger Brand travels um, to various places and things, that would have been unusual in those times. Most people would have stayed in their respective villages and never gone more than 20 miles in either direction but luckily beer brand's a warrior and a good one so he gets sent off on missions and things absolutely and it's a it's an interesting thing because i often you often see you know it's a very modern take on this um you often see lots of archaeologists and historians talking now about how you know, Britain wasn't very isolated. There was lots of travel between, you know, there was people coming from all over the place and people come from Turkey and from the south of Spain and from Africa and all over the place. And we traded with all these places. And it's true that, that obviously some people had come from all of these places um, and there's you know, been, been bones found and uh, of people from different locations in the British Isles um, and also people from the British Isles have been found to, you know, to have been buried in, in far away places. And also the lots of trade goods that we know have come from all over the place. But the reality is, and I think uh, the, the, this, this modern conversation implies that everybody was traveling around all over the place. I think the reality is that was like 1% or, you know, very, or even smaller number of people that were traveling around. I don't think very many people were traveling around because we know, I mean, even looking back, less than 100 years people didn't travel very far even within our lifetimes and um and we didn't have this sort of multi-ethnic world that we live in now and 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 people were very isolated and, and insular and i think it's it's interesting to kind of get that balance and and, and make it interesting to you know, have the characters travel around more widely as you say and still keep it plausible 
Yeah, I loved the way you did in Forest of Foes. You've got Beer Brand on his band traveling to France. And of course, Beer Brand can't speak French or whatever they spoke then in those days for French. Yeah. And I love the way he learns it throughout the book. <laughs> I remember I lived in France for six months and I was exactly the same. You go there with very little confidence and it builds up as you go. Well, well I'm glad you, you, I think you're the only reviewer that's picked up on that. But um, I, I, yeah, I think that's part of the way I, I think is I try to think of the reality of the situation. And even then it's simplified because as you say, you know, what language did they speak? There are multiple languages spoken in France, um, just as there were multiple dialects of different languages spoken in, in Britain at the time. And I, I put in the note at the end i've decided to say they all speak a, a, a single language or at least everybody from all the regions of francia can understand you know each other because otherwise it just becomes too complex but i have you know i do think about having someone who can actually translate because otherwise it just doesn't make any sense you know bayer brand a, a, a guy born and brought up in kent who then travels to northumbria and lives most of his life there traveling to france wouldn't suddenly be able to communicate with the with the french i mean he can't read or write or anything so he's definitely not educated enough to be able to i mean he could pick up the language if he lived there obviously he's not an idiot but um <laughs> yeah. he, he so he does you know throughout the book he picks up some words and he learns a few bits and pieces the same way as if you went on holiday to a foreign country for a few weeks you might learn how to you know order a few beers or whatever that's kind of the level of um of his language but i lived i lived in spain for many years and of course i went through the process of learning a foreign language and obviously i know you can learn a foreign language and get bilingual and you know get fluent in it but it takes time and and so, a certain level of natural aptitude as well so i've got in the in the other series in the hunlaf books the a time for swords series the third one is um a day of uh, a day of reckoning which i'm i'm just editing now actually and in that Hunlaf goes down to um, Islamic Spain and um, he's picked up some of the language. I've, I've had to explain that in the intervening couple of years between a night of flames and a day of reckoning, he's been basically having language lessons from an Islamic thrall um, who, who's, who's in his band, who's been basically teaching. But he's Hunlaf is a monk and has already ascertained in the first book that he's got a great affinity for languages. So he's already, he can speak Norse, he can speak, um, obviously, his native English, he can speak Latin, he can read and write Latin and Greek. So for him to pick up Arabic is not unbelievable so but but yeah i've had to sort of write that in and explain it a bit and even so when he's there throughout the book there's lots of times when i have these scenes where you've got they're like creeping around in some sort of uh battle situation and you've got there's a norseman there's some english men welshman there's hunlaf there's a joke in there somewhere <laughs> yeah probably and and there's some there's some arabs and there's a frank there's all these people together and of course there's sort of a couple of them can speak arabic so they speak to the arab guy and then the the, the, the english people are saying what do they say you know i have to write it in because i i hate the idea <laughs> that it just wouldn't you know I, I try to put myself in that situation and think well you know you'd have to ask someone to translate and it, i try yeah. not to slow the, the the conversation you know try not to slow the book down the action down but you need to kind of have something in there that just is a nod to the fact that they can't all understand each other yeah yeah i mean it's the same with travel because travel took so long in in earlier times well even as you said 100 years ago that the main form of transport was on your feet basically so in a book you you can't allow that amount of time <laughs> that they would have taken to get from a to b it would be extremely tedious yeah, or or you or you you can, but you need to write something that happens around it, or you kind of do one of those, you know, two weeks later, you know, we arrived in Rome or whatever, you know. So yeah, you can. <laughs> I suppose you can kind of gloss over it. And in fact, Forest of Foes, the ninth Venetia Chronicles, as as Sharon said, is all set in in France, in Francia, um, because they're traveling to Rome. But I'd never anticipated before starting that novel, before sort of planning that novel out in detail, I'd never anticipated writing about the travel through Francia. It was just going to be a book about Rome, the next book. But then as soon as I started researching it, as you say, you have to travel all the way down and searching the routes. And I discovered certain interesting historical events that happened at that time. And I thought, and to to the, some of the characters, I thought, well, I have to write a novel around this. I can't just sort of not talk. When 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 one of the actual sources from the time, which is the, the life of St. Wilfred, throws up certain 
specific events that happened to Wilfred in France at that time. I thought I can't ignore that. That you know, this has been given to me now on a plate. I have to now write a novel <laughs> around these strange events. That yeah, that it's funny place. how that happens, isn't it? That novels get hijacked a little bit as you go into the the subject more. Yeah, absolutely. I think with historical fiction, maybe more than any other, because as soon as you start reading around the specifics of the subject, you think, oh, I can't ignore this. No, no. Well, I mean, you started off, you started off uh, with Bear Brand. Is there any of you in Bear Brand? Do you identify with him at all? Well, Bear Brand is, you know, big strapping warrior. <laughs> Um, <laughs> who all the women fancy, and he he can sort of win in any, any battle. So obviously, so you could be twins. <laughs> obviously, um, he's identical to me. No, I, I actually um, no, I think he's obviously. I think I think most. Well, I don't know. I can only speak for myself. I think probably I identify with certain aspects of most of my protagonists. I guess you put some of yourself in. Or I put some of myself into all of them. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting one. I think um, the the closest I'll say is is. So I don't think I'm anything like him in terms of character, really. I mean, he's got a he's got terrible anger issues and he's had a horrible childhood um, where he was abused. And my childhood was not like that at all. It was idyllic and my parents were very nice. And so I, so really, <laughs> um, he's he's the sort of the, the typical um, troubled, you know, flawed um, character, really, um, which is which is unlike me. But I do yeah. realize that I, I realized actually years after publishing the first book in the series, The Serpent Sword, that there were there were certain elements of it, and I, I don't know how I hadn't thought about this before, but there were certain elements that were very autobiographical. So mainly in the fact that I had moved up to Northumberland as a child from Sussex, um, and I'd been bullied um, by the, the the school kids. You know, some of the some of the boys at school had bullied me because of my accent. Yeah, and then I thought, wow, this is interesting. I've created this character who's gone from Kent, so very close to Sussex, up to Northumberland. And he's only gone from Kent specifically because there were links to the Kentish crown. So it sort of made sense, you know, otherwise I maybe would have had him come from Sussex. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, um, and, and he goes up there and then he sort of, you know, falls in with different bullies and horrible people. And instead of getting his head kicked in all the time you know he turns around and fights them and you know ends up killing all his enemies and i thought i wonder if that's just me living out some sort of fantasy <laughs> of what i would have liked to have done to these bullies yes at school. i don't know I, it was years later that I, I thought about this and there's other elements to it as well i think uh, that first book specifically i think is quite there's there's it was literally the first novel I'd, I'd written. I know lots of people write, you know, novels that never get published. This was that was the first novel I wrote. Yeah, and um, there are other things around it. So Bear Brand falls in with this crowd of. I mean, he's only seventeen. He's very um, impressionable and doesn't really know what he's doing. He's out of his depth. He falls in with a horrible band of of brigands, really, after the first battle that he's in, and they're sort of roving the land in a sort of you know, outlaws, really and doing horrible things. And I think that reflects a moment in my life when I was in my late teens and I moved out from, you know, from my parents' house and I, and I started sharing a, a flat with, with, another, with a guy, an older guy. And not that we did any horrible things like that, but I think that influence of... And it, it, well, basically, it became quite a toxic relationship and I ended up leaving after a few months and we had a big falling out. And, and again, it was years later that I looked at it, I realised that the Hengist character, this older, um, charismatic character that Bayeran kind of falls for for a while, was very much like me moving in with this guy who was much older than me and sort of, and, and you know, I could see a, a fork in the road in my in my life where I, I made some difficult, there were difficult decisions that I could have made. And, you know, I, I, I yeah. hopefully I took the right decision. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was sort of, you know, it got to the stage of, I don't know, there were drugs, you know, getting, I don't know, it was just, it was just a bad time. And I sort of thought, I, rem I, I distinctly remember looking back and thinking that is a moment in my life that I could have gone left or right. And I yeah. thankfully chose the right way, which led onto a path of, you know, reasonable success and normal life and getting married and having kids. And I could have easily gone down the rabbit hole and gone a different direction and have ended up in a very different place. And I think that's, that's, one of the things that kind of influenced that first book and Bear Brand having this moment of having to sort of face up to what is, you know, what what's the way you want to go? Do you want to turn into this horrible character or do you want to fight against it? And in his case, of course, he fights against it and the rest is history. But I know it's a difficult read, that part of the book, actually, when he, there's some really horrific things going on and Bear Brand doesn't really know how to respond. Yeah. Well, talking of horrific things, 
Uh, what I'm quite interested to ask you, obviously people die in your book, some of them quite brutally, some close to Bear Brand as well. Now, quite a lot of people die in my books as well. So I'm interested to know how you decide who to kill and who not to kill. You see, Derek decides it by, oh, Sharon likes that character, so I'll kill them off. So, <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, that's exactly the same way I decide, Sharon. <laughs> pretend that I like the characters I don't like and I can get rid of them <laughs> absolutely that's the thing so you've told me now who you know you, you like certain characters so you, you better watch out for them you know <laughs> I'm very worried for kids is it Sinan or Kinnan I'm very worried oh I, well I think it's I think it's Cunan or Kunan actually um Cunan yeah probably yeah right, Kunan Oh, I'll read it right next time then. <laughs> um, so really, it's the same root as Conan. His, I was originally going to call him Conan, uh, but I thought it was it was too on the nose, so I changed it to Conan. This is another derivative of that name. But yeah, I don't know the decision-making process. I don't think there's a very... Well, I, I, as far as I'm aware, <laughs> there's not a very in-depth decision-making process that goes on. I think there's certain points in the series, or in a series, any series really, where it feels... For the type of books that we're writing, yeah, and that you write as well, Derek. That you know, lots of action and adventure and fighting. Yeah, it feels ridiculous that nobody gets hurt or killed. And I, I've also, you know, looking back at certain books that I've read that have been very influential to me. For uh, one that jumps out that I always mention is one of my absolute favourite books is Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. And in that, loads of the main characters die throughout the book. But it feels it's incredibly cathartic and and sort of you know you 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 get very up, up I don't know if cathartic is the word but it's very emotional you know it, it it really hits you hard but at the same time it feels very believable and it ups the stakes for everybody else it makes everything feel more real and more scary you know so I know that when certain characters have died in books of mine people have said later oh I really thought that maybe this was it and maybe Bear Brand was going to die you know, later on in the, in the next fight, whatever. And I think without that sort of jeopardy, yeah, of really yeah. important characters suffering bad consequences and potentially dying, it takes away the edge of the rest of it. You know, I think if one day there is a book where Beobrand actually is killed in the book, people would be shocked, but they wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't it wouldn't come as like a total shock to them. I don't think it would be like, oh my goodness, this is impossible. How could you kill him? Because he's in horrible battle situations all the time, and and people get killed. No, I totally agree. I think it, that's the that's the route I've followed, certainly. Although I must admit, I don't know whether this, this happens to you, but I, I do sometimes almost change my mind or reverse what I was going to do. I was going to kill somebody and I decide not to kill them at the last minute or even rewrite it. Yeah, well, funnily enough, that has happened to me. I won't go into the details of the characters anything because it would spoil things, but... No, no spoiler alert. But, but actually... <laughs> um, in the first draft of one of the books, my editor actually said, this character that you've killed at the end in this in this fight, you shouldn't kill because they deserve a better death in a later book, which I thought was an interesting take. And when I looked back at it, I realised that, yes, it wasn't necessary for the stakes or anything. The stakes were already high enough. Somebody else had already died. You didn't. It didn't need. You know, somebody else. I didn't need to kill off everybody in the in the group. <laughs> you know, it's, so I think the call was right from the editor. I think he'd seen that. I think he'd seen that. Look, you've already killed off some important characters. People have died. It's already pretty gruesome and gritty. You don't need to kill off people. And it was very much in the very almost the last throes of the battle. And I think it was anticlimactic, even though that might be very realistic. Yeah. In that people do just get killed um in real life in a fight but but yeah i think it was the right call so that's happened and i think in this very latest one that i've been writing again i had a moment when i thought that i was going to actually kill a character off and in the end i kind of relented myself so i think my first sort of synopsis i'd sort of said they'd die and then i, I came up with a different solution to things so yeah when we were talking to ben kane recently he said he he was at the moment he was actively trying to avoid writing's too much fighting because he said there's only so many ways you can you can slice cut hack or whatever um and i sort of get that uh, does that occur to you at all or are you happy to um yeah it, well it definitely occurs to me that there's only so many ways of describing <laughs> detailed fights and i think sometimes i think it was um christian cameron who writes you know lots of fight scenes mm. and he writes very well and he obviously does those of sword fighting and yeah. all of these things himself so he knows it, all the sort of techniques 
that he was sort of saying that sometimes, you know, the best descriptions, I think he posted something on Twitter by, or somebody else maybe did in response to his post about um, a, a, a couple of lines from a David Gemmell story. And David Gemmell does great. You know, he'll do yeah. blow for blow, blow by blow sort of you know, battle scenes. But then he'll have other moments when, it, and I think this example is like something, you know, somebody entered a room and it said two, two, two warriors rushed him they died you know <laughs> it was and i think there is a moment when if you've built up enough action and there's enough description and stuff you don't need to describe blow for blow every every thing and i think that um i can sometimes fall into the trap i think of trying to describe too much but i think not just in fights i think sometimes it it, it happens you know you're trying to get sort of too much detail in every aspect of a story and sometimes you've got to step back and just say you know they they battled across the courtyard and killed you know several men and got to the other side you know you don't need to describe every single blow yeah you have to sort of think what is actually the point of this scene what what, what you know yeah is it the fighting or is it actually that they get somewhere well, yeah most of most of the time it's about them getting to the other side of things and you know how things affect them and then every now and again you want this really i, I suppose like in a movie you want like the final sort of you know the climactic battle scene you know which is kind of blow for blow or, but um, you don't need it in every fight. But but yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to to hear that Ben's doing that. And um, I think after time, we probably all do that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done lots of things of sort of trying to work out what's the you know, trying to make fights different. And so I'll always be thinking about yeah. you know what's what can change in terms of the landscape or the weather or the weapons used or the the different sort of situations. You know, can the warriors be injured in certain ways or be hampered in certain ways or have you know not have the right weapon or what whatever weapons snapping weapons breaking so there's all sorts of ways of thinking about yeah making it different from other fights so i, I get where he's coming from that there's only so many ways of saying you know you stick a sword in someone yeah i mean it the other thing you can do of course is, is make the outcome the detailed bit so you're not describing the battle but yes yeah. the, the way in which you describe the outcome gives a a few hints as to how things unfold yes yeah I mean, I have to say, I find the I actually find the battle scenes and the fight scenes probably the easiest parts of writing. If you had to choose, if I had to choose, you know, the bits that were going to be the easiest and fastest to write, it is the fight scenes. And so I, I so I tend to kind of dwell on them, yeah. I suppose, maybe more than I should, because I think, well, if I enjoy writing them and they're easy to write, then probably that translates into the when the reader reads it, that they flow quite well. So do you have a favourite character, Matthew? Mine was a Simon, or is it a Chenon? Achenan, Akenan, something like that. Achenan. According according to the narrator, Barnaby Edwards, the narrator of the audiobooks, it's Achenan. And he's asked someone who's an expert, so he probably knows. Right. So Achenan. And I still haven't forgiven you for that. I'm not going to do any more spoilers, but I haven't forgiven you for Achenan. So now it's Cunnan. I'm a little worried about his safety at the minute. But who is your favourite character? Is it Beer Brand? That's interesting. I don't know. I, I don't know if I've got a favourite character in the Benicia Chronicles. I don't think it's Beobrand. I think um, I, I thought about this quite a lot, actually. When you've got a main character that is a hero um, action character like Beobrand, sort of this flawed, troubled hero that tries to do the right thing, but it's always, you know, he's a bit not exactly boring, but he's kind of the the linchpin around which all the interesting stuff happens. I mean, he, he's he's involved in all the interesting excitement, but he's not the most interesting character to write, um, I think. Um, and I think that's probably the case in many books where you have like a warrior type character at the centre of it. Um, so I, I would, I probably, I prefer writing some of the other scenes really. Um, I have, I liked in For Lord and Land, the whole storyline with Conan, actually, I did really enjoy writing that. I said it was a, a sort of double storyline. I really liked that. I thought it was it was a nice change as well, because I wasn't expecting it. Yeah, and I try and do different things um, to kind of excite me and hopefully the readers as well. And I know some readers said they didn't like that. Others said they really did like it. So you can't you can't please everybody. <laughs> but I liked that, and I liked writing some of those scenes more. I guess than the Bear Brand scenes in that book, but um, but it's interesting because I because I always write chronologically as well. I don't so even though I did this split um, narrative, I didn't write all of Conan's story and then write all of Bear Brand's and then intersplice them. I literally I would write one chapter of Bear Brand and then jump to the chapter of Conan and back, you know, and do it that way. Mm. 
which I think kept it fresh. And it means that you try to move quickly to the next bit, you know, without getting bogged down or bored of it. So, um, but I would kind of look forward to the Canaan bits more and I wanted to, <laughs> to get to the next stage there. So I did enjoy that. I think I've enjoyed writing some of the, the, um, some of the villains more. Um, so Hengist was great fun to write because he's horrible. Um, <laughs> and I, I think probably for the sort of the, the goodies, um, you know, the, 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 the characters, I would probably say that I, I enjoy, I really enjoy writing Kenred, the monk. Oh, yes. Yeah. He's always, he's always fun because he's, you know, he's, he's more, sen he's very sensitive. I mean, Bear Brand's quite sensitive, but, you know, Kenred's sensitive, but at the same time, he's got sort of a bit of a hard edge to him. He philosophizes about things. But if I was going to say all of the characters that I've written, who's my favourite? I think probably Dunstan from um, The Wolf of Wessex, mm. actually. It's probably my favourite to write. My favourite character, really, I think. I think it's probably, um, yeah, it's probably my favourite character. Is he going to remain a standalone then, or are you going to do another one with Dunstan in? Because I did enjoy that book. <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, early on, after, just after finishing it, I thought about writing another one in, uh, and then... My editor said, well, why don't you just leave it as a standalone for the time being? Because it's nice to have a standalone for people to jump in um, mm. that want to sort of read your books. And I think I think that's the right decision. Um, and a lot, a lot of people have discovered my writing through reading Wolf of Wessex, A, because it was successful and, and, and you know, got some press and things. So it was it came at the right time, just at the beginning of lockdowns in 2020 as well. So but I think secondly, because it's a standalone. So I think it's quite daunting for people to look at a series of books and think, oh, I've got to read nine books in this. You know, they don't want to necessarily buy the first book in a series of nine or 10 or whatever it's going to be in the end. So. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's I've got to the point now that I'm a bit scared of going back to it and writing a sequel because I don't know if it would live up to the expectation that I or the readers would have. So I think it might be best leaving it as a standalone, but I'll never, you know, never say never. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a funny situation. I never really thought about it at the time, but now that a few a couple of years have gone by, I do have that sort of anxiety thinking that if I went back to write another one, would it be as good? And if it wasn't, then you kind of tarnish the the first book, you know, you, you kind of weaken the legacy of that of that character and i think maybe it's best just to leave yeah. it as it is and just make it a great you know great standalone story that i'm happy with and most people seem to enjoy i mean interestingly when you'd written serpent sword and you were writing the sequel how how did you feel about writing the sequel did you did you think oh crikey have i used all my good ideas up already or how, were you confident about it um, yeah, I was a bit nervous about it, thinking that, you know, lots of my great, you know, best ideas had already been poured out into that first one. But I think because I was following sort of historical events and also the Serpent Sword hadn't come out when I wrote the sequel. So that was the that was the interesting part of that. So my at the time I had an agent and he was trying to sell the um, the Serpent Sword right. to publishers and, yeah. and failing. But during those few months, I was writing the sequel. So by the time I'd finished the sequel, pretty much I'd had all those rejections, but really it was written in the vacuum of not really knowing how the book was going to do, or a lot, lots of it was anyway. When I'd very first started looking at The Serpent Sword, I'd written um, a synopsis. Well, it was, it was, when I say a synopsis, a really high level sort of bullet yeah. points almost of like, you yeah. know, Bear Brand will go to this place and he'll fight so-and-so and he'll kill this person and this will happen and, and he'll die at this battle or whatever. I had this kind of, this this sort of plan and it covered his whole life until he was an old man and, and, I, and I thought it was going to be one novel. So when I finished The Serpent Sword, when I realised that actually that was a novel length book and it only covered six months of his life, I thought, oh, better start writing the next one. Um, which again covers just a few months and so I had in the in my in the back of my mind that there were all these events that were going to happen and so originally I'd had the what happens with Hengist at the end of the Serpent Sword was originally going to happen in a completely different battle which I'm trying to remember was, I think it's the battle of Mesa Field in in, in um, Warrior of Woden in the book number five and originally, I think I had that sort of confrontation going to be taking place there. But I realised that to make the book a standalone, I didn't want to have a cliffhanger. And so to make it a standalone with a good, um, you know, proper ending, um, I needed to have a, a final denouement, a com confrontation with the villain of the piece 
rather than I didn't want him to linger and be sort of one of these characters that just lingers on as the villain throughout the whole series because I find that a bit lazy really and although he's a great villain you can maybe do it over a couple of books but I think if it sort of spreads over multiple books for a long time it does feel a bit lacklustre from the reader's perspective yeah 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 you can have the bigger villain you can have the big i don't know king or an emperor or whatever who's like moving the pieces yeah but i think the um the the individual sort of baddie that um that's the the, the main antagonist for the protagonist you know, is is good to sort of have them have their comeuppance in, in some way yeah, yeah I agree. readers like closure yeah i agree because i mean you get it on telly an awful lot these days don't you where you go through an entire series and then the end of the series is a cliffhanger for the next one <laughs> like... oh god yeah and i think I, I i try to leave some threads that that you know, people can pick up and want to read next you know where where they're going next what they're going to do next but you really want closure for the main story arc of that book i think and of that tv series as well i agree with you mm, on that as definitely. well yeah right so you have a new series now um which is it has a time for swords and a night of flames isn't it yes that's right yeah. at, at the minute set about a hundred years after beer brand story just over a hundred years after beer brand story i think isn't it yeah it's probably 100 150 years after something like that yeah because seven nine seven nine three it starts and beer brand starts yeah. in seven sorry six thirty three so we're, we're 160 years between the start of each so what made you start a new series that is 150 years after the first i mean i think if it was post 1066 people would see it as a totally different era and yet i think because it's pre-1066 it's sort of you look at it as all one period but it isn't is it it had changed things had changed by that point yeah um i think i think i naively thought it was all the same period as well um that's the re- the truth of it and so i was looking to write something new and i wanted to write something in first person just because I wanted to do something different. So it's it's always about challenging myself as much as, you know, writing something else. And so I thought I want to do another series. Um, I think I'd had a conversation with, um, I think it might be with Angus Donald at some event. And he'd said something like, oh, it'd be good. He'd said he'd wished that instead of just writing all of his outlaw Robin Hood novels that he'd, um, alternated between those and another series and done sort of two series back you know back to back mm-hmm. um alternating between them and I thought that sounds like a good idea I'm going to try that but um I was just too scared really to to jump to a completely different era and I'd written Wolf of Wessex which is set in 838 I think it is so that's early 9th century and I'd and that's sort of again early Viking age so I'd done a bit of research about that period and I was just a bit too scared to jump completely to a different era with all of the research that that would in, entail. And I just thought, oh, well, this is only 150, 160 years later. I can, you know, that's really, it's all the same. <laughs> of course it isn't the same. And as soon, once I started... I can wing it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, basically. And once I started writing, writing it and researching it, I realised that there are lots of things that are very similar. Um, but of course, all of the... The, the well elements around religion have changed and politics have changed and um you know and, and then i've got the characters actually traveling to different locations that i've never been to um and of course then you have to it's all the politics in that area and all the the stuff that's going on in in that place as well so it's a whole another tranche of, of things to to research and so i decided actually that changing to a completely different time wouldn't actually be that much more work I think you once you start moving location, <laughs> like going out down to Islamic Spain um, in this third book, I've had to research. And I don't, you know, I don't, my research is not that in depth that like I could go and do a degree on Islamic Spain or anything. But obviously you have to read around the subject and try to understand what's been happening over mm. the last few years and, you know, what's what's going on there to, to make it feel, you know, authentic and get the right sort of lay of the land. And so I think really moving to any period in history would really in, have the same amount of of um upfront cost i guess to to me as a writer and having to research yeah i think so yeah so will you do like bernard cornwell did with sharp's son where he turned up in the um civil war books will you have a descend descendant of beer brand appear <laughs> in these books well well, I'll give you too much away. I mean, in in a time for swords, which I'm pretty sure you've read, but um, there is a little mention of the fact that when he goes to Bebenberg, Hunlaf actually says that he's heard yes. 
he's always been told that maybe you know he's a descendant of someone you know bayer brand whatever so whether hunlaf is or not i don't know but his he he's come he comes from Ubenford, um hunlaf does so um there's this <laughs> perhaps and um in fact you heard it here first yeah so perhaps he is there's there's a reason why he um when the vikings attack lindisfarne while this monk seemingly sort of uh you know pious monk turns around and actually starts fighting yeah, them the um, <laughs> and that's perhaps you know down to his dna and um and if and if you look at all of the books in fact i think if somebody's really clever and looks carefully at all of the books you could even find a thread through to wolf of wessex and perhaps a link to bear brand but i won't give that away because nobody's told me what it is so i'm gonna have to go back and read them all now <laughs> again <laughs> But um, but I have I've sowed the seeds in a pre in one of the Benicia Chronicles. I've sown the seeds of a connection to Wolf of Wessex, so that people that are very you know there's a tenuous link there, but people could draw the you know join the dots and say, oh, I, I see, that's how Dunstan is linked to Beobrand. Yeah, fabulous. I like that. Yeah. So who knows? So maybe if I write in completely different time periods, I'll have you know characters. <laughs> it would be like it would be like um, uh, Blackadder, you know. <laughs> I'd be tempted to do that. <laughs> Wilbur Smith did that, didn't he? Uh, he had the Courtneys in earlier centuries. He went back to that and so on. So right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. possible. It's possible. I'm sure readers would like it. Yeah, I like to have those little links in there. There's there's a couple of links in the Wolf of Wessex one. Where at one point they hear um some charcoal burners are singing a song and um i talk about the song and the song is um i can't remember what i call the song but it's a song about a couple of characters from the benicia chronicles you know so so there are things like that with little nods that if people have read the whole series they'll they'll get the links <laughs> yeah yeah i, I quite like hunlaf i must yeah. admit he's probably my favorite character of yours why did you i'm going off piece a bit here That's okay but yeah. Obviously, it's a it's a kind of magnificent seven or seven samurai origin in a sense. Yeah. What made you do that? What? Why did you decide to do that? To use that uh, story? Oh, that's a good question. I don't. I can't remember the moment that I had that idea. But I, I, actually, I cannot remember the moment. I think it's just the fact that Seven Samurai is one of my favourite films. And when I started thinking about yeah. the book, I just thought, oh, you know, could I use that sort of, you know, the fact that it had been retold in a western setting i thought well couldn't it just be told that's that sort of same type of story be told in a completely different setting yeah and then when i had once as soon as i had that idea i thought oh you know that works really well and i you know i went back and i, I at the at early stages of that writing process actually i remember then becoming quite obsessed with seven samurai and i watched the magnificent seven as well and went off and and i even there was the there's a modern <laughs> um seven um, magnificent seven movies when i watched that and I started getting really into it all. And I sort of thought, well, I know the Seven Samurai yeah. is the is the source material for the whole thing, the Kira Kurosawa movie. And so I, 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 watched, I watched that and I looked at it and I, I was really sort of analysing it. And then I realised after a little while, I had a conversation with my wife and she said, you don't need to kind of, you, you don't want to just rewrite seven samurai as a as a novel that's no. that's not what you what you want to be doing here you sort of said you're inspired by it then just be inspired by it so that was very good advice from her and so i sort of stepped away i kept in one scene that that is a real homage to seven samurai <laughs> um which which is the the scene where in the seven samurai movie one of the samurai shaves his head to look like a monk yeah and he goes into he goes into a building to to rescue a, a child that's being held hostage. And I've I've kept something similar, and it's very much that's very much a nod to the movie. But apart from that, I thought you know step away from the film, yeah, yeah, and just um, get on with writing the book. You know, based on that sort of very that, that concept. There's a couple of other little nods in there. You'll you'll you, people would would see to maybe the Magnificent Seven early on in the sort of the, the bringing together of the characters. Yeah, then at that point, it definitely becomes. Um, you know, my story and it's very much just a inspired by as opposed to just a total retelling of yeah i mean what it does enable you to do is to to invent characters from different backgrounds and origins which reflects the kind of people that might have been around in the period which is quite interesting yeah yeah so i liked the sort of motley crew idea <laughs> 
of bringing people from very and i like the idea i think you know you've got the british isles and i thought well hang on a minute but like you said before but there's a joke there so i thought well i can have a scots i can have a picked i'll have a yeah. you know a welshman i'll have an irishman i'll have an englishman so i i did th- and i thought well i'll have a norseman i'll have a viking in there as well and i thought i should probably have a female character as part of the the seven as well. token <laughs> not a token not not token she's not a token <laughs> character in there but I thought, no. as i was sort of breaking down this whole thing i, I mean the thing is the, the the likelihood of a woman actually fighting in the front lines in combat was was incredibly rare and i mean there's a lot of talk mm. in this sort of revisionist history we get at the moment lots of talk was like shield maidens and things i'm sure that there were a few but but it's it must have been incredibly rare so i had to sort of create this situation where there is this character who whose father had taught her to to shoot a bow very well and so she can you know she can join in with the defense of the of the village um but you know she holds her own and she's a proper tough tough cookie um but but yeah, so it was it was good just to throw and, and you know throw, throwing a, a woman into the mix as well. Then you get that that edge of you know do some of the some of the character male characters sort of you know fall in love with her and you get this sort of a bit of an unusual situation where her husband's like thinking what what the hell's going on here? Why are you spend all the time with these warrior blokes? You know, and because uh, I, I thought that was quite realistic. You know, he suddenly she's like she's like I've got to I've got to help defend the town. And he's like leave screw that screw that you know not hanging out with all those rough warrior blokes. Come and look after the kids. You know, and do cook my dinner. Yeah, I did like that. I did like that. <laughs> I mean, I remember you. I think you've done a on the serpent sword. It, it was it a concept trailer or with a view to a film. Has there been any development on that, or is that still sitting? Or can you not tell us? <laughs> well, no, I can't. I can tell you because there's nothing to tell. So yes, we did this. We did a, a trailer. If you, if anyone wants to see it, it's it's available online. You can see. Go to theserpentsword.com or on my own webpage as well. There's, you know, it's it's up there as well, MatthewHarvey.com, and it's on it's on YouTube. So if you search for it, you'll find it. But um, so we put it together with, with it's, a, it's a long story, really, but to, to cut it down, basically, we wanted to try to fund or, or get get funding for, for making a, a, a TV series of The Serpent Sword, the Benicia Chronicles, really, with each book or, you know, hopefully being a series, a season, as they, as they call it nowadays. And we, we, we I worked with some really talented people and a, a scriptwriter called Greg Stewart, who's also a novelist. He's got novels out there. So if you look for Gregory Stewart, you can find his stuff. And he's he writes plays and, and things as well. We did a treatment of it. And then he wrote the first, the pilot script. And and I was working with a with a, with a small production team in the south of Wales. And we, we didn't have any money. So we wanted to do something that would make it more um, accessible um, and interesting for prospective production teams or, or, or streamers or whoever we, we want to pick it up. So... Greg wrote a, a script for the trailer based on the, the first novel. Um, so it, in, instead of actually filming the nine hours of television and then sort of taking the best bits, we just wrote a script for a two minute trailer um, with multiple locations and all you know lo- a huge cast of characters. We got all the people together. Um, we uh, filmed in multiple places all over the south of, of Wales and south of England. We got original music scored for it, and we got a BAFTA award winning sound uh, person. So, so she did the sound um, for it, and it's so it's incredibly professional, really well well put together for for basically no money at all. Filmed over sort of seven days um, in early 2020, and, it, and yeah, I think it looks amazing. It looks like there's some money behind it when there really was you know just a few hundred pounds and everybody did it for free really and then during lockdown we had lots of movement on it in in that we managed to speak to people that i don't think we would have been able to speak to normally yeah yeah because everybody was stuck at home that was an amazing moment but i think we were a little bit unlucky that we hadn't got the trailer ready just before 2020 i think if if we'd got it right at the beginning of 2020 ready we didn't get it finished until sort of june and i think if we'd had it out and ready in sort of february march time yeah I think we probably would have sold it to a streamer because they were so desperate for content. They were all very worried about the content. And we managed to have those conversations. So we we spoke to people from Netflix. We spoke to the production company that makes The Last Kingdom, um, Downton Abbey and all those people. And and, um, we spoke to some people in the States. So we were speaking, we spoke to lots of actors and people. We, we, We did a lot of really interesting conversations. We were speaking to people who were holed up in New Zealand waiting to film the Lord of the Rings series (laughs) actors that said they 
would they would be happy to start, you know to appear in it and um, we got you know we got an agent in the states interested but the reality is that it's, it's just incredibly difficult and after a long time and lots of sort of false starts it hasn't really moved anywhere so if there's anybody listening to this <laughs> that, that knows that knows a film producer <laughs> you know we still want to make it and you know there's this, this the first couple of episodes are written there's a, a, a tv bible we've pitched to different production companies and and you know there's it's all there basically ready to go but um, obviously still a lot of work to to be done but um, it would be great to see it happen it really would I keep reminding myself that it's the books that's the day job, so you know, have to get on with the writing. I just think it'd be nice to have some television, some historic television that isn't based around the Tudors. <laughs> I like the Tudors, but they do seem to have have it sewn up. Well, yeah, yeah, and and we were trying to, we would, we really wanted to make it historically accurate as well, which is a real thing. And when we did have some of these conversations, it was a difficult conversation to have with, with different production people um because we said oh we want this to be historically accurate we you know it's one of the sort of things we want to do and a they don't really have any interest in that and b they think that what they're doing is historically accurate already <laughs> yeah yeah and and are quite surprised when you you know when you say like the, you know I, I i very much you know the last kingdom it's all great it's great tv and stuff but there's no way that those costumes yeah. and yeah. the stuff that they do in the it, it doesn't look right at all and 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 I don't really understand. And what I can't understand is why that is, because it's not like the real costumes, the authentic costumes would cost any more to produce. Mm. And it's not like they wouldn't look good either. So what it's almost like a conscious decision to make it not real. <laughs> and I don't understand it. That, that just sort of, for, for me, just becomes like a, a really confusing, it's a confusing question, which I've never really got an answer to. Yeah. So if uh, if it happens, have you got in mind an actor who might be good for for Bayer Brown? Tom Cruise, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> really, he's too short. I was about to say, isn't he too short? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it was um, that was that was a that was a joke about the Jack Reacher uh, movies. Yes, uh, that's right. So no, I think probably the real the the reality is. I mean, in the in the trailer, it was a a, a young actor called Liam Hatch and. He was actually quite short as well, but it's very, you know, he's, he's a he's, he's a personal trainer as well, and he's really you know, strong and fit. So you need to get someone who's physically able to do all of the stuff. I think is physically imposing, yeah. and really, probably it would be a bit like the new Jack Reacher series, where you get an actor who has done some stuff before, but they're not a household name, but they embody physically the character more. And I think you know, Bear Brand could be like that. You'd have to be big, strong. Um, imposing figure really yeah. yeah and yeah i don't think he'd have to be a, a household name and i think think one of the things that actually would would work would be to have a cast of of unknown actors um in it who could then become famous well of course utred was not uh, the actor that plays yeah utred in the last kingdom was not by any means a household exactly name. yeah i think you want to go that route where you get an actor that can embody the character um and then becomes famous off the back of it rather than you know, a household name that that kind of brings their own baggage to it. Yes, but yeah. it's an interesting thing because within within the industry, of course, it is those household names that get things made. So yeah. we were yeah. looking at the time we were talking to different actors, and we were kind of thinking it would be great to get you know a famous actor in as a small role as a secondary character. You know that we could maybe you know <laughs> I did toy with the idea of um, contacting Sean Bean <laughs> to be King Edwin. <laughs> Um, as King Edwin gets killed right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, he's very good at that. He's very good at that. Yeah, because I know, I know that that Sean Bean, I think, has said that he hates that he won't do it now because it's become such a, a meme. He doesn't like you know get, having these characters that get killed. Yeah. So. But I did think it would be quite funny to get him on and then literally kill him in the first episode. Well, you could have something like you say David Dawson as Conrad. Mind you, he's a bit too old for Conrad, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But but again, you know, it's it's about getting these. Um, I mean, again, David Dawson is a great actor, but um, I don't think he was that well known, you know, when he did The Last Kingdom. Mm. Um, but yeah. then they, you know, they embody that that character so well. So yeah, casting, interesting. We had a lot of discussion about casting. The Wolf of Wessex is probably the easiest one to make because it's a smaller cast. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a isolated, you know, story. So you could probably, it's it's much more like sort of true grit. So you got this main partnership of the the young girl and the older man. And I like the idea of um, Dunstan being an older man rather than a young, brash 
warrior is you know he's got a good head on his shoulders i like that about yeah him. i really liked that it was funny i um i had this idea exactly that idea about an older man a young girl who comes along and so on and then i read wolf of wessex <laughs> and i thought blow me down there it is well yeah, you know, I mentioned True Grit, so it's not massively original. Yeah, no, so no, no, no. I guess it's been done before. And then, of course, um, Giles Christian went on to win uh, the Wilbur Smith um, Adventure Writing Competition or you know, award this this year or last year with a with a story. I haven't read his book, but the the book is modern day. But again, it's a it's a, a father and daughter yeah. traveling through the wilderness, being chased by baddies, which sounded slightly familiar, you know. So I think it's a it's a it's a it, it works, you know, having an older yeah character looking after the younger one and and the the, the growth of their relationship and yeah yeah against yeah. Adverse, adversity so i've moved away from that idea now. well yeah. <laughs> well if you're going to set it in the time of the vikings or something then it might be a bit too close but i've got one more question though because we haven't talked about the fact that you are a rival to our podcast actually in that you're doing rock paper swords with Stephen a mckay which is absolutely fabulous podcast i really enjoy listening to it what got you two i mean you work really well together but how did you two come about doing that oh thank you for the for the nice comments really i i don't know i've never met Stephen um face to face apart from on zoom we've never been in the same room together so we've only we, we've talked though over the years when i first started self-publishing the serpent sword Stephen had just published his first one or two wolf's head novels mm. so just before me and he he seemed to be the guy to 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 watch really and to follow at the time so I did sort of emulate lots of what he was doing in terms of you know the way he promoted himself online and and I mean started talking to him online you know I'd answer his posts and we'd speak and and we yeah. ended up sort of talking a little bit via communicator a few times and over the years that just sort of became a more it's funny really sort of quite organically chatted we chatted more and more via messenger every now and again we'd see something funny or interesting in the news or about other writers or something and he would post you know so have you seen this you know and, and we sort of have a little bit of a natter and a laugh about stuff and we obviously got on you know on, a, on, a, on that sort of wavelength of sort of just joking about stuff and having a chat about things and then during lockdown I did a few um video live stream events because everybody was you know so desperate for content and just to sort of do something and I was so desperate to speak to someone else and one of them was and maybe I think it might be the first one I did was with um was with Stephen and it was very relaxed and we really enjoyed well I think you know we both seemed to enjoy it and we had a good chat and people seemed to respond to it and so then I'd been listening to podcasts over the lockdown period I started listening really then and um, walking the dog and listening to podcasts and stuff and so I, it's sort of been in the back of my mind that that would be a, I'd like to do a podcast and then but I didn't really want to do it on my own because I thought it would be a bit scary to be just the single you know person I sort of toyed with this idea of you know maybe trying to do more for YouTube do my YouTube channel a bit more and I did a few more um, one-to-one interviews on YouTube and things mm -hmm. but I really kept on thinking that the podcast would be the way to go and then what then sparked the coming together actually doing it was then Stephen early last year announced that he'd left his day job and was starting to write full time and so I thought oh well we're both writing full time I think he contacted me and asked me a question about something I can't remember what and I said and I sort of floated the idea because he was I think he was asking about you know what were my days like and did I find that I could write more or did I struggle to find the time and things and I and I think in that conversation I sort of said well, one of the things that it's it's quite lonely you know writing full time and I said it would be quite nice to do something in collaboration with another writer mm -hmm. um, um, and had he considered doing something like a podcast and I kind of floated the idea and then he was up for it and then at that point we sort of started discussing it and that's it the rest is history I enjoyed the episode with Christian Cameron I thought you you guys I think learned a lot from that one <laughs> yeah well we tried we tried to work out what was our sort of what were the things that we both enjoyed and what was what would make it unique and we decided well you know very much like um you guys doing this podcast um you know you're both in, into history and historical fiction so you've got a that your unique selling point is you're both published and successful so we sort of looked at it and said well we're both successfully published historical fiction authors who write action and adventure so and we both like rock music I mean he he plays guitar and other instruments and he sings I used to sing in a rock band so we said we really have these lots of sort of commonalities there so let's just um mm. bring those together and talk about all of those things and so it's been really interesting um 
and 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 again like like you we, we've got had some great guests on but we also do some of the um, episodes which is just the two of us chatting about different topics and we kind of just go with the flow really and seeing where it where it where it takes us and trying to sort of sit around these themes of rock music a history and action and adventure and that kind of covers pretty much <laughs> the whole gamut really of um, of what we enjoy so we've had that crossover with music and history it seems to me anyway quite an original podcast in the in the combination of factors shall we say uh which which i rather, I rather like well thank you very much matthew harvey it's been absolutely fabulous talking to you this morning i really enjoyed it i haven't stopped smiling yet <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> well thanks very much for having me on it's been been a real pleasure it's really great Always great to talk to you. Of course, I've met both of you before, back in the mists of time. Maybe one day yeah. we'll we'll meet again at an event or something. Yeah, that'd be nice. Thank you, Matthew. It's been absolutely fabulous talking with you. Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you both. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to meeting up in the flesh at some point. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much. Okay. So join us next time when Derek and I will be looking into Richard Earl of Warwick, um, whether he was a hero or a villain. I know which side Derek's on. You'll have to wait and see which side I'm on. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening today. I'm Sharon Bennett Connolly. And I'm Derek Burks. We hope you've enjoyed today's podcast and that you'll listen again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.